Thank you so much, Jangir, for agreeing to speak to us today and a warm welcome on behalf of the chairman of the CSMVS and the trustees and the BG, Mr. Sabyasachi Mukherjee, and on behalf of the Museum Society of Bombay, the executive committee, our members, guests, and our, on my own behalf. Greatly appreciate your willingness and readiness to share something with us on which you have about, we are going to have a public forthcoming publication. And we're really looking forward to this talk, which you have titled Bombay Rambles. And I know you have a very interesting set of slides stumbling on some hidden aspects of our city. So thank you, Jahangir, for doing this. We greatly appreciate. We have a fan following of yours in the Museum Society of Bombay. I can assure you about that. Ladies and gentlemen, a few words about our esteemed speaker. He really needs no introduction as a doctor. He's based in Mumbai and practices as a physician and a professor of medicine for whom photography is a hobby, but as he describes it and I endorse it, it's a very serious hobby. He qualified from the Grant Medical College with his MBBS and his MD in internal medicine and went on to the UK to work there for five years in different hospitals and obtained his MRCP in the UK and his DTM and H from London. He returned to India in 1991 and joined the Bombay Hospital as an honorary consultant physician and at the Bombay Hospital Institute of Medical Sciences and a postgraduate teacher at the Maharashtra University of Health Sciences. I know he's had his hand absolutely full during these last two years with COVID and has been extremely, extremely busy as a physician. And I don't know where he finds the time, but he says he does it on the weekends when he doesn't have too many patients to attend to. Over and above this, Dr. Sorabji has published a book of aerial pictures of Mumbai. It's called Above Mumbai, a very much sought after publication. And this was done in 2006 which was reprinted and with a revision in 2011. The book has been widely acclaimed and images from the book have been included as part of exhibitions at the prestigious Venice Biennale in 2006 and the Tate Modern in 2007 and the Canary Islands Biennale in 2009. His street photography from different cities across the globe was featured in Art India magazine. Many of his images were published at the Kala Gura Festival in 2010, and some have been selected for permanent display at the, duly at the newly constructed Mumbai airport. He recently exhibited his images at a group show of photography on Bombay at the Jhangirad Gallery in February, 2013. His aerial images are constantly used by organizations, activists within the city to demonstrate the growth of Bombay as seen from the air. He's currently working on his second book of unknown spaces in Bombay. We are in for a veritable feast of photography. There are about 300 slides, hold your breath. This is not a historical article uh, evening on the historicity of our city but a visual treat that you're going to have. Bombay is a city that was created and grew as a colonial antiport, initially under Portuguese rule and subsequently under the English. In the 70 or so years since independence, enormous changes have taken place in the city in terms of its topography and in the more recent and rapid replacement of old structures and edifices with new construction and into inverted commas, we have to call that development. This talk highlights a personal search for and the discovery of places and structures from the past. Some of these are well-known, but many of these are unknown. Some of them are accessible to all, but others are mostly hidden to the view of the ordinary Mumbai citizen. These peregrinations have taken place over the past two decades and sadly, 
many of our old friends, the structures photographed even recently may now no longer exist. But in a few happy cases, restoration has taken place. The familiar and famous monuments of the city have been mostly left out in the store, but included are some images of hitherto unseen aspects of familiar edifices. Hopefully, more of us will be stimulated to wander through the bylanes of our city and discover more hidden treasures. Jangir, I cannot express how deeply grateful I am and appreciate um, you sharing these images. And I'm sure the next demand would be, can we also go on a motorbike or a scooter with you <laughs> as you navigate the lanes of Bombay and join you in some of these exciting adventures. So ladies and gentlemen, a very, very warm welcome on behalf of all of us to Dr. Jangir Sarabji. Last but not the least, I have to thank our technical team. Don't know what we'd do without you. Thank you, Yashraj, ably led by Jason John, and also Aishwarya and Rinalini. So thank you. Sit back. Enjoy this wonderful show. Keep your questions ready. We'll have Dr. Prachi Jariwala, our executive committee member, who will be taking the, con the questions. Please put them in the chat box. As you know, after we have the formal function and the recording is over, we do throw open um, the screens to all of you to step forth like you would do at the end of a talk at the CSMBS and ask your questions. So thank you very, very much, Jangir. Greatly appreciate this. And I hand you over to the technical team for full screen sharing. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Feroza, for that very generous introduction. And thanks a lot to the technical team for running me through this. And uh, I uh, am very uh, happy to experiment with a new talk. I keep doing these talks on my aerial images and uh, juxtaposing them against aerial images which have been taken in the past to show the changes that have taken place in the city. And when Feroza asked me to give this, I thought that let's try something different. Uh, I've taken all these images which you're going to see myself, none of them are from the internet. So there's some limitations because uh, I haven't been able to get to everything. And uh, when I look down on some of these aerial images, I often used to look down and wonder that where on earth are all these places? Uh, where, where is this? What is this? And you know, what's this on the ground? What's this clump of green over here? What's this clump of green over here, etc. cetera? Or, uh, uh, you know, so uh, I decided that I just want to, Go back, yeah. So I decided that I wanted to actually get down and explore the city and try and relate what these places are, what these streets are with my knowledge of history and uh, with what I could see from the air. And I found that roaming around uh, was difficult in a car, of course. You could walk around sometimes nicely on a Sunday afternoon, but uh, uh, that was also difficult. And uh, walking took a long time. So finally, I had to increase my skills at riding a two-wheeler. And for the last couple of years, as Feroza said, I've been zipping around on the scooter to various places on Sunday afternoons or sometimes late at night, trying to discover different parts of the city. Uh, what has also helped me are some of the maps. And this one in particular is a wonderful one, which is the map of the native town of Bombay completed to 1855, which shows all these little streets, which then I go down and try and track and say, okay, what's this become? What has this become? Where is this now? What's happening here, et cetera and see what I can come up with. So we have uh, about 300 plus pictures to go through, but uh, I don't think it's gonna to be too difficult because many of them are just images. And I did a little rehearsal and found that I was just about in time. So I'm going to slow down a bit and take it uh, a little bit longer and possibly go five minutes or seven minutes over the normal time. So I started by going down and exploring an area of the city which is called Manvi. It was an area of the city that I was always very nervous about because I remember reading in history that this is where the bubonic plague epidemic had started. And in fact, uh, Dr. Vegas, whose statue you can see in the Framji Kavasti Institute opposite the Metro is the one who sort of put out the warning bells and said, Manvi is where everybody's getting bubonic plague. So I thought, oh my gosh, this is not the right place to be. But of course that was a hundred years ago, but the streets are very crowded and you can see that there are lots of little temples and mosques. But what I was looking for were for the old Jewish synagogues of Samuel Street, which is in Manvi. And you can see one of them, which is over here. Unfortunately, the doors were locked, 
but you can see that the Star of David is on that and uh, it's contained within this. And this one is called the Shar Harahamin Synagogue on Samuel Street. There's another one which is just a little bit down the road from there, also in uh, Manvi. And this one was built in 1845 and was open, so I could roam around inside it. They were quite welcoming and happy to have me there. It was a Sunday. And you could go inside the synagogue and see where they place their holy book and they have their sheets and shrouds and lamps, etc. And it's uh, quite charming. There weren't that many people around. Some of them were coming in just as I was uh, going out. But uh, these two little Jewish synagogues are some of the oldest Jewish synagogues in the city and not as well known as the one which we know in Kalagora. Some of the buildings in Manvi were also very interesting. And you can see that when in Manvi, there were a lot of wealthy grain merchants because Manvi being next to the docks was where uh, people had their grain storage and many of the merchants would actually just live on top of their business establishments, etc. Lovely carvings within the doors and above the doors and some nice, handsome looking buildings over there. But essentially, it's a commercial area and there's not that much. Suddenly on a side street, you come across what looks like a completely Victorian building stuck in a little alleyway of Dongri. I'm not sure what exactly this is, but I think this is the administrative institute or the administrative headquarters of the Ismaili community. But very well maintained, lovely stone, lovely columns, etc. hardly ever seen. The jewel in that area of Dongri and Manvi, of course, is the Irani Mosque, as it's called, and it's claimed that the tiles for this mosque were imported from Iran and then placed over here. It's a Shia mosque, also quite accessible. You can walk inside and see the grounds. It's quite quiet on a Sunday, has lovely pools of water. The tile work is exquisite and quite lovely and uh, very uh, nice to look at in all its aspects. And uh, this is one place that you actually can visit quite easily. It's just off uh, Muhammad Ali Road and uh, relatively unknown. Many people have read about it, pops up in publications, but hasn't been seen that often. And uh, next door to that is the, uh, what is supposed to be the only uh, hammam or bath or public baths in the city of Bombay, which I'd read about and didn't realize they were next door. So before anyone could stop me and throw me out, I just whizzed in with my camera and managed to take some pictures. You can see there's a, a sort of a not a very uh, inviting looking pool over there. And here it does say welcome, but I'm not sure that I'd be very welcome. And uh, people are supposed to have their baths over there. So that's the last of the public hammams. I don't know that there were many of them in the past, but certainly this one gets written about from time to time. Also in this area in Manvi is this structure which people haven't seen, which is the Ismaili Jamaat Khana, the meeting hall for the Koja Ismaili community. Uh, it's got a lovely large courtyard, it's got a nice looking building, and it opens out into, this area opens out into a community hall where children come in on Sundays for the lessons, etc. And it has this charming little Victorian clock tower, which is there, which really when you're walking through these narrow streets of Manvi, comes as a shock to see something so sort of utterly European stuck in the middle of that, and the clock actually works. There is hardly anything by way of public structures in the Manvi area. The only thing that seems to be there is a clock, which is in a bit of a roundabout. And uh, it has a lot of uh, uh, carvings of animals over here and a clock, which I don't think works and columns, etc. And the traffic whizzes around this. So there wasn't that much on a Sunday. Some of the detailing is nice, but really this is largely a commercial area with a lot of streets. Also in uh, Dongri is the uh, Kabrastan or the mosque of the Ismaili and the Koja community, which is like a large, vast garden space. You walk down this long uh, street with plants on either side. You come to a little mosque, which needs a little bit of cleaning. So basically, uh, uh, I was here and I was explaining the fact that there is this Koja cemetery, which is also part of Dongri, which is a very crowded space. But suddenly you walk through this, goes down a long alleyway, opens up into a courtyard where there's a mosque. And then beyond that, there's a large garden space with a whole bunch of uh, graves and headstones, some of which are quite decrepit, a lot of palm trees, etc. It doesn't seem to be very occupied. I'm not sure whether that's because the community itself is small and doesn't require that much by way of, uh, uh, of a graveyard. Again, in Dongri, suddenly you come across this building with these lovely tall columns over here, which looks like it's going to be replaced by the one on the left at some point or the other. 
Umar Khadi is also interesting. It contains the children's remand home, which I don't have a photograph of, but which used to be the original jail of the city before the Atharo jail was there. But within Umar Khadi, there is a, a sort of a church and a large playground, which you can see over here, which has some interesting architectural elements. And uh, again, you have the uh, stone, which is uh, laid down both in Latin and in English. Moving away from Umar Khadi, when you come to Baikala, you find that some of the old single screen cinemas still exist. Some of them have uh, been recently painted. And on one of the streets, I came across a gate post with something written in Hebrew, which I found quite surprising because uh, I couldn't understand why this was actually there and this line was there. But on doing some research, I discovered that there was a sort of a part-time synagogue which was placed in one of these buildings. And this one is somewhere uh, behind uh, the zoo, Rani Bagh. You can see that some of the structures were built with uh, a lot of love, the carvings, the columns, the designs that went into them are really special. And in this one in particular, you can see that the arches here are different from the arches here, are different from the arches here. Very nice old wooden shutters and stone uh, building, very handsome buildings in some of them in those areas and possibly uh, just falling to pieces because of the fact that they've been rented and there is rent protection, so they can't have the rents increase. The Ubha Parsi statue used to be actually at Nagpara. It's now been moved to one end of Clare Road where we've always known it to be. And uh, it's been recently restored. But uh, I found the grandeur of the mermaid at the base uh, quite uh, interesting when juxtaposed with uh, the squalor that you see around it on the streets uh, right now. So it was built for a completely different era. Also in that era is the Christ Church Cathedral, which uh, was apparently built by Lord Ray because he found it too much of a trudge to go from governor's mansion on Sundays at the Hafkin Institute all the way into town. So he had a cathedral built halfway through. And the columns over here are supposedly the spare ones from the town hall, which were not used and lent over here. Again, very peaceful, very lovely, and completely hidden from the road unless you sort of get into the compound. In that area also was the famous Baikala Club, which was very posh, very English, had its own race course, and no uh, natives were allowed, even if they were uh, royalty. And there's absolutely nothing uh, to show where it was or any of the structures associated with the Baikala Club, which at one time extended from where Bombay Central Station is now, all the way up to uh, Nagpara and Clare Road. But once in a while, you find a little signpost which says Club Road. And this is the road which is at the back of the Maratha Mandir, which tells you that this was one of the roads bordering the uh, Baikara Club over there. You can see one of the old uh, cemeteries in Mazgaon, which uh, also is for the Koja community. And within it is the grave, very well tended, of Jinnah's wife, Rati Jinnah, who died at the tender age of uh, 29. These are the old houses which you see in Mazgaon. This was some years ago. I'm not even sure whether it exists now. But gracious, spacious living, nice compounds, a porch where you could park your cars, and lots of airy verandas. A little fountain, which got stuck in the middle of a traffic roundabout and uh, has uh, almost been buried. This also is a lovely old house, which apparently belonged to some prominent lawyer, but now is occupied by the Regina Pachis Institute and the church who bring in people here into Bombay uh, and use it as a hostel for training. Whoever built this uh, in the Chor Bazaar area must have been to Cordoba because he's taken the design elements from the Mesquita. But interestingly, the carved uh, latticework in the windows is also very nice and pleasing. Uh, this is the gate to what is called Hasnabad. I don't know if you can read that over there. This is also on Mount Road in Mazgaon very nicely maintained. And if you were to turn 180 degrees, you'd see this, which is the mausoleum of one of the early Aga Khans. It's almost like a mini Taj Mahal in the center of the city. And most of us won't really have uh, seen it. It has a nice spacious compound in which you can walk around as well and appreciate it. Further down in the same area of Vaikala is the Masina Hospital, but this used to be the main residence of the uh, Sassoon family who were really extremely prosperous in Bombay in the 1800s, 
and then left Amas as soon as independence was declared. They just sold everything and walked away from India. It wasn't that much. They'd been moving out even before that. But the interior bits of the Sassoon residence, which is now the Masina Hospital, show you little bits of grandeur, this lovely staircase, which goes up in this manner, with the lights up there, another elegant staircase leading up to a portrait of, uh, I think that's Jarbai Masina over there with those two empire style mirrors over there. Again, you can see the staircase. And here you can see embedded in the staircase is the motto and the crest of the Sassoon family with probably a little bit of Hebrew in it as well. This is the gate post of the entrance to the hospital or what used to be the Sassoon house. There's a nice lithograph of the Prince of Wales coming in a horse carriage for dinner to the Sassoon residence. And within the gate, again, you can see the crest of the Sassoon family falling apart. I don't know if these are there anymore because many of these pictures were taken almost 20 years ago. Here's another institution which they endowed in the JG Hospital compound, the Sir Sassoon David Hospital, which is actually very functional. And also they donated a clock tower to the, uh, uh, to the Victoria Gardens in those days, but there's no portrait or picture of any of the Sassoons and this has been nicely restored recently. I actually enjoy taking pictures of the old signage and uh, some of these have lovely fonts and lovely raised bits and take you back to a previous time. And uh, you can get some of them before the obligatory uh, bits in Hindi and Marathi were enforced. Here's another structure, which again, I stumbled on somewhere off Clare Road with this lovely uh, loggia beautifully uh, painted. And uh, I'm not sure what it was. It is something associated with the church. I think it was built as an old folks home. It has a description of it built, I think, in 1928, and I think it was done by Gregson, Batley, and King, but uh, there's no mention of what the usage is for. Some of these old Chilia restaurants are absolutely charming. I mean, you sit in one of these, and you could probably think you're in Cairo. There are many of them. <clears throat> there are many that I remember. Some of them used to be right opposite my house. There used to be the Bustani restaurant, Allah Belly Cafe. Uh, this one is the Rouhani. There was Imdadia, etc. I don't know. Uh, I don't track the Chilia restaurants as much, and I hope that they aren't disappearing. There's a lot of similarity between them and the Irani restaurants in terms of their flooring and their marble tables, etc. This area of, of uh, Dongri and Nagpara does come alive at night as well, and they have a lot of activity. You can see over here, they have uh, basketball courts, and they have uh, an active basketball competition which takes place at night, which again, I stumbled on when I was walking around with my camera, seeing everybody cheering for them here and there. So that's uh, fun. And uh, during eat time, of course, everything comes out onto the streets. The streets are impossible to uh, walk on also because there's uh, so much jostling and uh, everything becomes al fresco with these tables being laid out and uh, fancy food being cooked for those who are breaking their fast and for those with uh, iron cast stomachs actually. So it's fun to see the ladies and the children breaking their fast after sundown sitting on the floor with just fruits and some uh, uh, liquids. And here you can see, uh, look, peeking into the mosque, people at their evening prayer. Again, this is one of the streets which gets taken over and the mosque, which is particularly popular at uh, that time of year. Uh, the other mosque, which I recently came across was the uh, Jama Masjid, which is situated behind Loar Chal in the Prophet Market area which has been brilliantly restored over almost 15 years by Kirtida Unwala. And you can see bits of it, which are uh, absolutely charming. This was uh, run and maintained by the Konkani Muslims. And I think uh, the trustees are mainly from the Rogay family. But the quality of the workmanship in the original mosque and the quality of the respiration are truly breathtaking. And it's amazing that we have something as lovely as this on our doorstep. And frankly, I had never visited it, though I always knew it existed but those ominous gates keep people out. Though when you speak to the people, they have a library with manuscripts into which researchers come regularly. So I don't see why they would uh, not have people coming to actually visit them if they wanted to. The workmanship on the stairs is also very good. And here is a large big prayer hall. And each one of these apparently represents a spot for one of the faithful to kneel. And these are aligned in the axis of Makkah so that uh, one person who kneels in this direction will be praying in the direction of Makkah, as would one person who occupied one of these little terraced spots on the roof of the Chama Masjid if he was uh, uh, 
you know, bending down for his prayers. Uh, there's a water tank with fresh water which comes from there. There are carp which are present in it. And uh, overall, it's, it's really a charming place. And it was a pleasure to actually see that. I put a little break there, a blank slide, because we're going to move from that now into a different part of town, which is the more sort of English and imperial part of the city. And this part of the city I like very much because of these lovely covered arcades. I mean, they're so precious that people visit Turin and Bologna because they have something like almost uh, uh, 20, 25 kilometers of these arcaded streets. And even here, we are protected from the rain, protected from the heat as you walk along that. But unfortunately, what could be a huge big stretch, stretch with you know, little tables outdoors for people to sit and have coffee, et cetera, are not actually there. Outside the Khadi Bandar building, which I just showed you, is the embedded in the stairs, W and L, Whiteway and Laidlaw, which is the initials of what that store once used to be in English times. Here you can see the pleasant columns. The flooring, unfortunately, is broken up all over the place. And uh, in fairness, these arcaded uh, uh, pavements are not as wide as the ones that I've seen in Italy, which are enormous. I mean, they're fabulously grand and beautifully decorated. And it's worth visiting these city, those cities just for that. But we have some bits of it which are actually nice, and one whole section of it could be made into a good street. I had heard of all these colonies, of course, everyone's heard of Khushubag and Rustambag and Jarbag, etc. But I hadn't heard of Marazban colony and decided to go and explore it and found that it was a charming little enclave just off a little street called Gilda Street on the other side of the Bombay Central Bridge. And here you can see a little bus to Mr. Marazban there. And they have these little houses, which are all occupied by Parsis and part of the Marazban colony. Again, something which I didn't know, the school, which is part of the colony over there. And that's it. And staring at us over here is Mr. Pettit, who endowed the city with a lot. And this little portrait of his has remained well preserved and is part of the Pettit Sanitarium. Above that is his crest. I think everybody wanted to have their own crest in those days and prominently display it on the buildings which they endowed. And uh, here you can see some staircases from these old Parsi homes. This one is from uh, Sir Jamshaji Tata's house. And uh, it's been restored after this to a much higher standard. And this now has become all office buildings and the Tata family no longer live here. This is another lovely staircase with a stained glass of uh, Zoroaster in the house of a Parsi shipping merchant. You can see the ceilings with their French uh, sort of frescoed paintings on the walls within the Jamshaji Tata house and what is now the RD Setna Trust offices and an empire style mirror again, which needs restoration in the same office of the RD set Matras. These buildings you sometimes come across, I find them quite charming with uh, what must have been lovely long open verandas with closed rooms on either side in quiet little places. This is uh, off Grant Road on Proctor Road. This is somewhere off the Girgam Road. This is somewhere off uh, Kalba Devi. You can see that people are getting more and more adventurous with their painting schemes. I'm not sure whether this is, this is an indication of the fact that they're supporting saffron or they just like the bright colors. And uh, But it's been nicely done and uh, the contrast has been brought up. A tiny little ground plus two house, which probably consists of just two rooms sandwiched between these buildings somewhere in Abdul Rahman Street. Again, you can see that these were designed to have lovely long open verandas, you can see a swing over here, but they've been enclosed or they've been grilled in, etc. And uh, the ventilation and the purpose for which they were built is actually lost. This house, which belongs to an architect family called Raut at the foot of Fringe Bridge is one of the most charming little houses, which still exists in Bombay in its own compound. And it completely encapsulates what life must have been in Bombay in the 1920s and very well maintained by them. Another little house, again, in the Girgam area with uh, inside that little gate, surrounded by these tall skyscrapers around with its own little garden. God knows how long it'll last. Here's another one, which I know well, which is, uh, uh, you know, not going to last very long. I'm sure it'll be demolished in a little while. And you can see that it uh, was once very grand with this lovely statue in the center of a long veranda, but now uh, that's all crumbling and faded away and, uh, in need of some tender loving care. 
I wanted to look for things which were particularly uh, relating to the Portuguese period in Bombay. Uh, because the Portuguese basically had Bombay ceded to them by Badr Shah in the 1520s and continued to rule it, albeit from Vasai rather than from the Bombay that we know, right up to the 1660s when it went into the hands of Charles II and the East India Company. But I could really come across very little built structure from that period. This is a Portuguese watchtower, an octagonal Portuguese watchtower, which is actually present in Navy Nagar, far down at the end. And you can walk up to it from there and look out onto Prong's Lighthouse, which is at the other end over there. This is the uh, Portuguese gateway or the entrance into the Bombay Castle area, which is deep within the uh, naval establishment of uh, Lion Gate, right inside Lion Gate and all the pits inside the original manor of Garcia Orta, et cetera, is gone. But you can see that these structures are actually from the Portuguese period. And there's a little more detail of it in that. And there's also a Portuguese sundial, which uh, uh, is present over there. And there's something odd about this sundial. I think it was it showed just the time on one side or there's something strange about it. I can't remember. But this also looks as if it's not in very good shape. And uh, you can't access these areas unless you know someone in the Navy who will let you go in. Things like this, which is called the Portuguese church in Girgam, are really not from Portuguese times. They're much later. And even if there was a Portuguese church at that time in the Portuguese times, it's probably been rebuilt many times over, just like the Portuguese church in Dadar. Here is another little uh, Portuguese uh, church, which is somewhere in the Chira Bazar area with uh, dedication to the construction, which took place in 1891 and finished in 1896, uh, which is in uh, Portuguese. There's a Goan Institute building also in the Chira Bazar area where uh, the Goans used to have a lot of academic meetings and lectures and Goan aristocrats from Goa would give speeches and concerts, etc. A very handsome building. And you can see that it was built with a lot of uh, attention to the architectural detail. But unfortunately, now it's also fallen into partial disrepair. And bits of it here have been rented out, I think, to a restaurant or a cake shop or something or the other. And some bits look as if they could uh, be excellent. But you know, as a standalone building, it would be fabulous if it was restored properly. When we move into the Portuguese villages of Kotachi Wadi and Mathar Pakari, it's been featured a lot. And you can see a lot of these pictures. These are the ones which I must have taken 25 years ago. And these are Kotachi Wadi. Mathar Pakari is undergoing a period of restoration. This is much more recent, as is this. And the oratory, which is present in those tiny streets, which is open. And you can see it uh, open out onto the streets, the little staircases which go up from the side. Everything's been painted and looks quite charming and elegant. And uh, they've used some nice colors. But what's interesting is that many of these houses were used as clubs. So the Lawrence Club of Arosim. So they were like hostels for people who came from Goa and who used to sort of come from their diocese or from their church or from their village. And they knew that they had a place to sleep and uh, they had a place to put their things. Here's one in Portuguese, Clubo dos Batim Nenses in 1924, also in Mathar Pakhari. And this is uh, uh, also one of the little village houses in Mathar Pakhari. Here's another club, club of Nossa Senora dos Remedios, house number 31. And this one over here is established, I think in 1937 as a chamari where people who came from Goa to Bombay would stay here, share the residence, share the expenses and stay together in these little houses. These small little crosses, which you find on footpaths less frequently now, were put up by many people after the plague of 1896 as gratitude for having survived that particular plague. And here's a little tower, uh, like an Italian campanile, which is attached to a school. And next time you pass, the Arthur Road Jail, which I hope you're not planning to visit, you can actually notice because this is right opposite there. The British bits are, of course, very prominent. If you just go around the Oval, you'll see all the grand, elegant structures that were built by the Brits. But the little bits are also quite interesting. And they have some nice signage. The Imperial Cinema, which is situated on Lamington Road. The Statue of Apollo, nicely covered with a fig leaf. Uh, which is part of the McKinnon McKinsey building in Ballard Pier. This intrigued me. 
I couldn't understand what this was. It's a lion, it's an eagle, it's a shield, and it's on a building which is adjacent to, but not part of the St. Xavier School. And finally, I discovered that this was the Harris School, which was named after Lord Harris, who was a governor of Bombay and was very fond of cricket, started the Harris Shield competition for schoolboys, and was accused by British administrators of being more interested in cricket than in, uh, uh, than in governing uh, the state of Bombay, the presidency of Bombay. And uh, this probably has something to do with Lord Harris or the Harris School. The Brabant restaurant and bar, a beer bar, there's, it's non-existent anymore. This building has been demolished. I just passed it a couple of days ago and looked out for it. It had been converted into a showroom for reclining chairs, but that's also gone. And so I believe has London Diet, London Pilsner, etc. So the Edward restaurant, again, the signage has changed. The Lord Irwin restaurant and bar. Uh, it, unfortunately, when I passed by today, I saw that this section of the signage is faded away and gone, and I think it may actually go away. I wonder if Lord Irwin's family knows that there's a restaurant and bar still around. And I was just chuckling and thinking to myself that it would be uh, quite impressive to ask your date to join you for a meal at the Lord Irwin, but uh, she might be quite surprised when you actually take her there. The Duke of York restaurant, somewhere in Colaba, gone, doesn't exist anymore. And the Cafe de la Paix, which does exist and is somewhere behind the Portuguese church. The King of Iran doesn't exist, but his restaurant exists. And this is in uh, Baikala. And I presume this is uh, owned by some of the uh, Irani family that continues to run it with the same name. The Irani restaurants do lend a lot of uh, fascination and they're very interesting because they are a bit of an anachronism and a time warp. And some of them can even be very quirky. Like this one, which is in Matunga, refers to the Irani wrestler omelet and the Irish coffee, which is Irish terror, Iranian black tea, and Irani special kima. For the adventurers who want to try it, you can give it a try. The Yazdani restaurant and bakery seems more concerned with bodybuilding and bodybuilding pictures inside than with pictures of food or what he serves. That's the inside and interior of the Kayani which is very accessible and popular. The B. Merwan and Company, which spread a rumor that it was closing down and had hordes of people rushing to have their last mava cakes over there, and then decided that they actually weren't closing down after all. But again, lovely signage over there, which really takes you back to what these signs must have been like in the past. And I was lucky because I managed to get into the Bastani restaurant before it shut down and take this photograph of what uh, I refer to as the 20 commandments of the Irani restaurants. And I find them really funny because uh, this photograph has been published in many places, but it's an ori this original from this one. And the ones I particularly like is no talking to cashier, no leg on chair, no discussing gambling, and uh, no address inquiry, whatever that means. And I was thinking to myself that how nice it would be for me to have one of these uh, rule lists outside my clinic, etc. No asking the same question type twice, no shoving your reports in my fa face, face, no uh, interrupting when the patient's talking, no trying to second guess what the patient is saying, blah, blah, blah. So it's an inspiration and I'm going to form my own uh, 20 commandments soon. Here on Marine Drive, you can see that this Zaver Mansion has got in set a little crown, some uh, English sympathizer obviously built the building. And here you can see Queen Victoria recessed into a grill. Most of us would have seen this while waiting for the traffic lights at Princess Street. This one, I don't know whether it exists anymore, but it's uh, an, an access through these stairs uh, for the princes to the Malakshmi Temple. And it's uh, somewhere opposite Cadbury House. You can see the sign of Kashmir House, which is recessed into the gates, which is there. And of course, all the imperial statues have been shifted out. Here's the Kalabura, which has been placed in Rani Bagh just now, one of the Victoria Gardens of Edward VII, which uh, was uh, roughly where uh, opposite where Rhythm House used to be. And that's Victoria, who used to nestle in that nice canopy, which is in Singania House. And that which would stood where the VSNL building is uh, right now. And uh, that's also moved. So these have been moved, but some are still standing. For example, here's one of Lord uh, or Baron Sydenham of Sydenham College, which is in the middle of the Royal Institute of Science and uh, standing majestically in his uh, 
toga. And you can see the lovely dome and stairs right on top of the Royal Institute of Science as well. There are many which have been kept of academicians and governors within the town hall. And uh, the town hall has undergone also some very nice restoration. I think that's John Malcolm, who was a governor of Bombay. And here's the uh, Chief Justice's Court, or Court Number One, with the portrait of Lawrence West, the names of all the judges, and this is Tilak, and that's where the famous trial of Tilak took place. And look at the size of the viewing gallery of the court. It's almost like a cinema, and that's where all the judges would sit, and they do sit. That's Court Number One. These lovely stairs are part of the Elphinstone Technical Institute, which used to be the Elphinstone High School, and I think that's where my great grandfather actually learned his English. And Vacha's book describes how he came out in 1857 and all the schoolboys stood over here and looked out onto Azad Maidan, where Charles Forchett cruelly blew some suspected mutineers off the mouths of guns at Azad Maidan to quell any uh, signs of the mutiny in Bombay. The staircase is uh, really nice. The building could do with a bit of restoration, but now it's used mainly for administration of the education department. The milestones we've all seen, here are some of the lesser known ones. And this one's in Dadar, opposite Chitra Cinema. This one's somewhere in Matunga. And uh, sometimes you wonder why they're on these roads. What was so important about these roads? And some of them are lost. They're getting buried as the road gets higher and higher. This is the one mile one, which is actually on the Kalba Devi Road, which was the main road. So if you left the fort, and made a right turn and go past where the metro was, you would go down the Kalba Devi Road, emerge from Paidhoni and then continue down from what is basically Clare Road and then onwards to Parel and out of the city, etc. These little cannons, uh, which used to be part of the fort, were preserved when the fort was demolished in 1865 and embedded into the ground to be used as bollards. I'm not sure what that actually means. I think they were used to anchor horses and tie them to this. Here's another one, which you can see, which is again turned upside down and into the ground largely neglected and not really known. This fountain has been restored. And what's interesting is that each of these plaques represents one of the victories of uh, Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington during his India campaign. If you go into the police station at uh, Kolaba Causeway, you'll see this little tablet, which marks the site of the former crossing about 300 yards of Creek that separated the island of Bombay from Old Woman's Island. The Creek was built in 1838. So there was a big gap and the sea used to rush in from roughly where uh, the police station is now and where the museum is now. And in high tide, it was impossible to cross that and people who tried uh, often drowned, especially if they came back slightly inebriated from a night on the tiles in Kolaba where the cantonment area was and the people reports of people drowning. And there was actually a ferry service which connected Kolaba uh, to this area and this was filled in and a causeway was formed and it was widened in 1838 and then subsequently later. The Grant Medical College, my old alumnus, that's the plaque which uh, you know uh, signifies the uh, inauguration of the college and uh, it was designed to impart a scientific system and the benefits of medical instruction to the natives of Western India of whom I am proud to say I am one and this is in the old Grant Medical College building. That's our College Amphitheater for the Anatomy Hall, which you've probably seen in uh, many films where it has been used for shooting. This is a get together. And within the pathology school, we have this articulated skeleton standing over another skull and saying genius alone lives, everything else is mortal. And these are all the pathology specimens which we used to come and walk in and pick up off the shelves to study. Here you can see the staircase of the uh, governor's house in the Hapkin Institute, and it was occupied by the governors of Bombay. Previously, it was a Jesuit monastery and was taken over by the British as a governor's house until one of the lady governors died of cholera over there, and then they shifted to the current residence in Malabar Hill because it was felt unhealthy. This lovely library with the uh, staircase going up is part of the Asiatic uh, Society. And you can see some of the signage is also very interesting in different parts of the city dealers in arms and ammunition in case you suddenly find you want a gun. And here you have someone who's an optician by appointment to His Majesty the King of Afghanistan, which is modified now to the Consulate of Afghanistan. He's put the obligatory in the bits in the corner over there. Fun. A Saudi engineer has placed his sign 
on top of a building which contains a whole bunch of uh, monkeys who are playing different musical instruments. And here's a particularly irate shop owner whom I came across near Chakla Street, who has had all these five products of salespersons, area managers, region and not allowed strictly to my shop. And dogs are also not allowed. He seems to dislike dogs more than he dislikes the people of Garnier, L'Oreal, Gillette, PNG, and Godridge. You can see that over here, somebody's crest or initials have been embedded into a rota and grill. I'm not sure who they are, but it'll be fascinating to find out. Here's another one, which is also embedded into that grill. Here's a tree of life, which we know from the mosque or the structures in Ahmedabad, which is now in the Anjuman Islam school. And of course, there are zillions of Parsi Agyaris in Bombay, which I haven't actually bothered to uh, photograph or include in the stock because they're pretty much well known, except for one which I came across. But on the side of one of these buildings is this thing in a very strange script, which I've never seen before. It's almost like hieroglyphics. And I think I've read some article about it being Aramaic or something ancient, but I was chuckling to myself and thinking some Parsi prankster probably just put in something over there just to confuse subsequent generations so that they would all be scratching their heads and wondering what this was all about. That's the crest of Sir Jamsaji Jiji Boy in the wrought iron grills, and that's a beautiful one uh, put among the stone in the uh, building where they have their offices, and the panchayat has its offices. This is a fountain donated by the Pettits in the Sakharbai Pettit Animal Hospital, which you can see here, which is pretty crumbly and probably will have fallen down. And there's a horse which is roaming around looking for care. And here you can see that's also uh, a tower which looks as if it's uh, not going to last very long in case it hasn't fallen. This was pointed out to me and it's in the compound of one of the uh, building complexes on Valkeshwar Road as you go down. And I was told that this is a, or what used to be a private tower of silence or a private dakma, which belonged to one particular family and would lay out their bodies uh, only within their own private dakma. And it still exists over there. And I think this is probably true because there are some lithographic views of uh, Valkeshwar and Malabar Hill, which show these uh, smaller dakmas, which are present on the hills. Here you can see this is within the Tata compound, uh, the, uh, what do you call it? The uh, commemorative structure to their dog who died and was buried under this. Another one of the lovely ceilings uh, within the old house of Jamshiji Tata. And then at the end of the road is something like a scene from Vienna with this grand old house, which is Tata Palace at the end of it. The stairs go up and down because uh, of the fact that the servants quarters at the back of the Tata house were actually smaller than the main structure. Here's a plaque which we passed by a zillion times of Dadaba and Auruji in the house of Colum commons at Flora Fountain under his uh, statue. There's a Mr. Gamadia staring at us from Princess Street, again hidden, haven't seen it too often. And this is a relatively unknown fire temple known as the Ashbur Ashburner Fire Temple, which I found of all places somewhere between SV Road and CP Tank when I was zipping around on the scooter. This magnificent anachronism uh, is the Ripon Club, a gentleman's lunch club which has uh, really been fortunate to survive for more than a hundred years and uh, still functions. Portraits of uh, Farsi grandees over there and the table set out for lunch with a little view of the fort beyond. Here's another little institute of the Pettits, which is a free dispensary built in 1893, again in the SV Road area. And this plaque uh, signifies that this building was an Anglo vernacular school set up by the Pettits in 1894. So there are a lot of plaques relating to Parsi charities all over the place. Some of them are particularly lovely. You can see the entire Pettit family have put up their portraits in stained glass with little uh, virtues, constancy, generosity, commerce, and charity above them. And this is in the Pettit library, which is really very useful because when I go there sometimes in the morning, I find that every single seat is taken quickly by people who don't have the peace and quiet in their homes to study for their exams and they come here to block their seats and then they spend time till late at night studying within the Pettit Institute. You can see the stairs and the gorgeous Minton tile flooring at the bottom and K.R. Kama of the Kama Institute who was a great orientalist with his portrait over there and stained glass behind. 
This is the Kaushi Jangir fountain, which is in front of St. Thomas's Cathedral with a little cross on it, which you can't see, which was donated by Kaushi Jangir. And he was known for some time as Kaushi Cross because it was suspected that he was actually a Christian sympathizer and more than just an Anglophile. And people were very nervous about Parsis converting to Christianity after John Wilson of Wilson College converted a few people in the 1850s and 1860s. Here's another fountain donated by Jamshedji Jijiboy hidden away in a compound in Navy Nagar. Here's another one uh, with these fountains which were put up all over the place in the pre bislavi era, I guess. And here are some street signs which may or may not exist now, but tell you a little bit about the history of the area which they belong to. Bread Market Lane near Fort Market. Here, strangely, this Bajoji Paruchamag is also military square lane. British Hotel Lane, where there used to be a prominent hotel just for the British uh, in the Lion Gate area, Sitafal Wadi in Mazgaon, Battery Street, where the battery for the fort existed, opposite Lings, Police Fort Lane, I think, huh? and this one, which I particularly like, it's uh, the uh, stand or the parking stand for two Victorias, designated by the BMC, and I must have taken this picture in about 1995 or 1996. Of course, all of that is gone, including the sign, Police Court Lane, and a Sassoon building, which uh, still bears the name of the Sassoons. The next few are these RIP pictures, because most of these have gone. This gorgeous carved building seems to have disappeared. When you see these high corrugated iron sheets going up around a compound, you know that that's the end of it. And really, it uh, should have been heritaged and preserved, but I don't think it has. This building, which I managed to get access to, is the home of Sir Victor Sassoon in the India United Mills compound in Prabha Devi. Fabulous view, looking straight out onto the middle of the sea link, and it's got the Mahim Bay and the Mahim Beach in it. But the house itself is pretty pedestrian. I would have thought that Victor Sassoon had something fancier, but apparently he had his own private little race course here, where he used to time his horses in addition to having a mill. Now it's all overgrown and quite decrepit, and possibly all of this has been demolished because it's becoming an Ambedkar Memorial right now. So at one time, it was supposed to have been a convention center. Here again is Sir Mangal Das's house, Gordon Das, T. Mangal Das. There's no house, and I'm not sure what uh, uh, that actually was. You've seen all the famous churches of Bombay, but some of the other ones are, which we don't go to often are actually gorgeous. This one is the Don Bosco Church in Matunga, made of this stone and a different kind of uh, 50s architecture. I'm not sure you would call it Art Deco, which seems to have different recessed bits within it. You can see even the church, the cross over here is inset and recessed inside with stained glass, lovely dome. And within this and the altar, they had imported fabulous Italian marble, which was placed on either side and top quality stained glass at the back, very well maintained. The crypt underneath is also worth seeing because uh, within the crypt, there are multiple uh, little baptismal fonts or whatever, and uh, these uh, mosaic uh, designs depicting various scenes from the Bible, very well maintained, kept in good quality. We whiz around town from Roman Catholic to the Protestant Anglican Church of the Afghan Church. On Remembrance Day, you can see the military band is at, in attendance, there's an old car, and within it, it's beautifully lit, and you can see the lovely columns and the fabulous stained glass at the end. It almost, I mean, you'd imagine that you were in some version of the Notre Dame on a day like this. Very nice, and the choir sounds gorgeous inside when they sing. Outside, there are crosses and the little plaques which commemorate various victories, but lots of interesting history within that. Here, you would think that this is a church which is in some rural part of the Indian countryside. It was not those tall buildings around there. But in fact, this is just on the other side of the Grant Road Bridge as you cross it and uh, very well preserved. John Wilson schools, which he set up because uh, he wanted to impart more education to Indians. And he himself was an amazing scholar. Apparently for the first two years that John Wilson lived in Bombay, he studied Marathi nine hours a day so that he became completely competent in the language and could translate the Bible from English into Marathi. This is the main church from which he preached, the Ambroli Church. And just adjacent to that is the school that he established in 1832 for boys. The other one which I showed you earlier was the girls' school. 
this structure, which is at the uh, one end of Flora Fountain, was supposed to be the cathedral church, but was cathedral school, but was deemed to be too ostentatious. You can see over here that's Shakespeare, and I think that's Chaucer and Milton, who uh, have been uh, placed in that. And this was supposed to be a school, but then I think they sold it off and made it into another building. Some of the cemeteries that you stumble across are some lovely structures in them. This one is the old Sivri Cemetery, which is uh, almost on the waterfront at the other end uh, beyond the Tata Memorial Hospital. The statuary is charming and uh, juxtaposed against the high buildings, looks very nice. And uh, it is a bit wild, but it's a, a very interesting place. And there's a lot of history to be discovered there, including the fact that the Italian community meets here, the entire Italian community meets here once a year, I think on Remembrance Day to commemorate the fact that the remains of all the Italian prisoners of war who died in India after they were shipped here, after their losses uh, in the North Africa campaign, uh, had their remains transferred here. And they died in India between 1941 and 46. Many of them went back to Italy afterwards, obviously, but uh, that's also present within the Sivri Cemetery. So a little bit of history there, which I didn't know about. This is the Armenian Cemetery. And there are no Armenians there, but the cemetery has been turned over now to our Baha'is and uh, the Baha'is are maintaining the Armenian Cemetery and using it, uh, the extra spaces for the Baha'is themselves. You can see that some of the stuff is written in this Armenian script over there within the cemeteries. There's a Chinese cemetery as well. And you can see that there are some English headstones of people who died in 1846 on board ships which were wrecked regularly off Bombay because of the fact that the reefs which spread out from Kolaba were terrible. And many of these headstones have been, you know, insensitively just taken and plonked somewhere else. All of this is in the Kolaba Navy Nagar area. And this is where the shipwrecks took place in the 1840s and how dozens of bodies used to be washed up along the shore, or along Chopati. And uh, finally, they put up this uh, lighthouse uh, to prevent people from uh, getting uh, injured on the five prongs that actually did occur. You can see some of the Hindu temples, uh, which are interesting. This one is in Matunga and has South Indian elements to it. The ones in the CP tank area have uh, amazing uh, carving in the screens with stone and marble. And I don't know whether you really need to visit Dilwara because uh, you have some wonderful uh, quality of uh, carved stone and marble within that. And some of them have uh, charming color combinations as well. Here's a, another Hindu temple at Banganga with uh, a modern building next door, the Hanuman temple. And of course, there's not much point in, there's nothing hidden or special about the BMC building or about uh, VT. But uh, there are things about which are nice. I managed to crawl up to the dome of uh, VT and uh, head out of that onto a ramp and took this picture of all these little spires, which makes it look very much like uh, a Gothic version of Paris. The detailing within VT is absolutely unbelievable. And on a clear day, there's just so much to admire in so many sections of the work which has been done in uh, different aspects of it. In the waiting hall, it looks like Saint-Chapelle in Paris. The quality of the Minton tiles on the walls and on the floors, which has been preserved. The staircase, which uh, is in the center of VT, is also gorgeous. And uh, as are the corridors, all quite well maintained. And you can see the dome from within. We've all seen the dome of VT from outside. But seeing it from within with the stained glass lit up is really a special experience. And it's open. I think on certain days for the public to go and it's really worth going and making a visit. And here you can see the dome of the Municipal Corporation building with the Indo-Saracenic touch to it, which is also very nice. And some of the other things which you can see in these buildings are these wonderful staircases. And here's just some random stuff which I've put together. This is the staircase, I think of Ruya College in Matunga. And then armed cars from World War II, which are lying in the compound in the VJTI building. Why, I don't know. What looks like a fort in the ocean is actually the Mukesh Mills, as seen from the Sassoon docks. And there's some fabulous Art Deco bits, some of it decrepit, like this cinema, which I think is the plaza in Matunga. And the Liberty Cinema is just an absolute Art Deco jewel. 
brilliantly preserved from inside and beautifully lit and really worth a tour. It's, uh, it's just amazing. The BSD building also has lovely art deco on its uh, doors and windows and these uh, lamps on either side. And here you have uh, lovely art deco in the United India Assurance Building on PM Road, which you would really not notice unless you happen to be walking and saw the different corrugations within the stone and the inset of the carved pits, which are actually there. Here's another art deco staircase in a private building at Churchgate. And here's an art deco flooring in a friend's house. Fantastic art deco. I think Bombay really has some of the best art deco not just from the outside, but from the inside as well. And here's a bunch of random things which I found interest. The smallpox ward, which is in the Kasturba Hospital. The layout of the Kasturba Hospital with these shaded walkways, which allow you to move from one ward to another without getting wet. The same within the Grant Medical College. This is Badar Bagh, where Hussein grew up, which was a small little uh, kind of a colony, not like the Parsi colonies. I think this is more a Muslim colony of Balaram Street in Grant Road. And here's Mr. Arthur Fisk, who is advertising private French tuitions as a professor of Francaise. And uh, this was on a, a gate post of a house, which was just behind uh, Kolaba Causeway, which I'm not sure is there. Wellington Bandar, inset, lots of things were named after Lord Wellington. The wraparound marble uh, walkway of the Royal Institute of Science and some of this bit, so this is the magistrate's court with these fabulous gargoyles, the arches in different shapes as they sort of go up and the quality of the carved stonework is just fantastic. Almost done. Here's a Victorian uh, cupola, which is in Rani Bagh. This is the uh, entrance of a private house in Malabar Hill. And here's the gate post with the lamp post of a beautiful bronze statue in uh, Napancy Road. <clears throat> Why somebody would put a crown on top of his building, I don't know. Must have been a dedicated Anglophile. The Mahajani uh, building, which again we see as we pass by Haji Ali, but it's worth going inside. And Vikas Dilawari has done a great job of restoring it as well. So I think I'm pretty much done. I've come to uh, the sunset of my talk, just as sunset happens to take place in our city, which can be quite beautiful. And I put this in just to show that it's not all downhill and uh, the city can look quite lovely at times. And uh, with that, I'll stop.